Hello everyone. Start off with a pain pill. <laughs> See? It says pain on the front. See that? Anyway. Um I had intended to have a normal live stream. And I hooked everything up. Everything's going well. Hey Gabe. And then I turn on the new DSLR, which I haven't touched in a few days, and it just says error. And I've done all the tricks, and nothing is making the error go away. And with the error, I can't use it to stream, which was my whole plan. And I don't know what's going on. I tried swapping lenses. I tried switching from battery to electric. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea. So today we're using the hideous webcam again. <laughs> Grrr. It's like, God, every week it's just something. Let me turn this thing off on the bottom of the screen. Um, I just want a normal, easy, smooth running stream. So <laughs> what we're gonna do is we're just not gonna sweat it. We're just not gonna think about it because there's nothing we do about that. Let's see. I've got my new iPad in. So I wanna see what that looks like for you guys. Yeah, and uh, kind of get a view. So this is the look of the iPad now that I got. So it gives me a second monitor. I can actually see a little bit what's happening in real, in real life. The uh, When we left off last Saturday, Dwayne and I had gotten about two-thirds of the reef done. We still had more to go. But uh, we, uh, you know, when we tuned in, there was more to work that night. We worked Saturday night. We worked on it Sunday. And we did a lot of work on the tank itself to get it to where it is now. So I gave you guys kind of a warning last week, like, this is going to be completely different than what you're used to. And most everyone said they liked it. So <laughs> I guess that's a, a nice thing, a blessing, because you never know how people are going to react. And I expected, you know, 50 people to say, what were you thinking? But a lot of people seem to like the open look or the um, some space for the fish to swim. I think there's a drip on the glass. So I, I'm annoyed because I wanted to broadcast in 4K with the Nikon. So if somebody has a tip... It just says error. It's right here on the top, just ERR. -R. And I don't know how to make that go away. Like I said, I tried swapping out a couple things. I don't understand it. I tried changing modes. It won't let me do anything. It's really weird. This is a Nikon D500. If you suddenly have some amazing tip, we can switch to a better camera during the stream. I'd be fine with that. So feel free to let me know. Um. Okay, so when we left off, we had done this much of the reef and left the balmy for Saturday night. And on Saturday night, we went through the here and removed as many anemones as we could that were the little tiny BTAs that don't belong in the reef. And uh, we pulled out a bunch of the Palatheoa button polyps. So those are gone. Uh, there's just a small patch of them here in front of the sea bay that's kind of impossible to get to. And I'm kind of thinking, I don't care if they're there. They're kind of inside, and if the sea bay finally one day stings them, that'd be great. The um, the rock work down there was normal. What had happened was the hammer coral had grown really tall. So Dwayne and I talked about, you know, what's the best approach, because one of his thoughts, which was one of my thoughts, was when we cut those hammers out of there, the sea bay might try to move. Where right now there's the skeleton of the hammers, and the sea bay was kind of like against it, and it didn't go anywhere. But I said, look, I just want all that stuff under the hammers gone. I want to bring the whole hammer colony down lower. And that's exactly what we did. We actually cut every one of these hammers to about this tall, <laughs> took off everything, got rid of it all, and stuck it all you know, in trash can buckets outside. And we filled up basically three five-gallon buckets of just coral waste. And that wasn't just like loose. That was like crushed down, keep putting more in. So there was a lot uh, that came out of the main reef. And a lot of stuff was saved in the frag system, and then a lot of stuff was just disposed of because there was no point, as Dwayne likes to say, no one's going to want that. And I'm sure some of you would, but logistics doesn't allow that. We had corals in the cooler in the fish room. Um, we had corals in the frag system. We even had moved some over to this side a little bit where we were working. And then Dwayne had to glue each hammer coral onto that rock <laughs> one at a time. And there must have been 60 of them, you know, 60 heads. Because at first I said, well, we'll just put a few there and then put them in the empty spots. That's my technique with all corals. When something breaks, I put it back in the middle and it makes it look more fi filled in or, 
or uh, more lush. I don't know. It just it it takes away the voids. And uh, as we're working, I decided no, I want to get rid of more skeleton and more skeleton and more skeleton. And I just trimmed everything down to short pieces and gave him a whole bowl of hammers. And I went and worked on the rest of the hammers and gave him a second bowl of hammers. And he just used tons and tons and tons of glue, planting it on the rocks one at a time. And he said, I've never done this before. <laughs> and then when he was all said and done, he's like, you know, that's not bad. So the end of the view now, looking at the tank from this side, looking this direction, it's nice and low. And you can actually see the reef rise. So I can actually see my view go up, kind of go down and go up again. And that was completely the plan. That was our, our master plan. We also moved the Gorgonian to the very back corner instead of being in the center on this end because it kind of blocked the view like a big bouquet. So that was pulled. And um, that's kind of where things were. We did a lot of sand bed siphoning. I went through a lot of water. I think we used a total of 210 gallons of salt water that weekend or in 24 hour period and the nitrates had come down to maybe about 60 maybe a little bit less and uh, then last night I worked on the refugium and I pulled out about half the macroalgae and I vacuumed the substrate which is reborn calcium reactor media which I just use as nuggets and there's a lot of detritus in there so I want to talk about that this is my vacuum assembly that I use, and I'll plug this maxi jet <clears throat> into a power strip that's got an on-off switch near near me, and I throw a towel over the power switch so it won't get wet. And that is how I am able to get power to my pump, and then I vacuum the bottom of the sump or the refugium, whatever I want to vacuum. I don't vacuum in the tank. There's no point. But there's a new screen now that's on the end of this that VCA came out with that keeps it from clogging up, which is fantastic. So the original vacuum attachment didn't have this. And it was $10. And then he added this little screen and a little insert right here, this little guy. And this would fit inside it. So it fits a Siche Nano Synchro Pump. And with that Nano, you have another pump you can use to do the vacuuming. And then all you do is vacuum, and then just all the water pumps out the tubing into a nearby bucket in front of my tank. And I, <laughs> I actually don't have any buckets. It's kind of crazy. With everything I've done, I mean, there's like one or two buckets outside filled with sand at the top. But I don't have any good useful buckets because I haven't bought salt by the bucket in 12 years. I buy boxes of it. I buy uh, barrels of it. And, and the few buckets I did have, they literally are cracking and the rims are breaking off and they're pointless and I've thrown them away. So I'm down to no buckets. I'm actually thinking about asking the local club, does anyone have any new buckets they want to get rid of? Because I don't want to go buy a Home Depot bucket when there's someone that just made salt and doesn't need their bucket. So if I can get a free one <laughs> or two, that would be really useful. So I had these little one-gallon buckets next to me at the refugium, and I was just working from bucket to bucket to bucket, and I pulled out, I don't know, 7, 12 gallons of water out of the refugium as I vacuumed out a lot of detritus from that area as well which was, uh, you know, it was time. It's probably been a year since I did that. I should do it a little more frequently. So this little guy here is available on my website. And this is the new version I was talking about with a little blue ring inside and the strainer on the front. And these go for $12 now instead of 10. And, you know, I ship them for six. So if you uh, would like to have a way to clean your sumps easily, you can do that. <clears throat> now on their website, they also say, instead of using a pump, if you had a desire, you can actually push this onto the end of three quarter inch tubing, and I believe that's three quarter inch outer diameter of the tubing, and you would slide it in, and then I guess you'd be using it like in a bare bottom tank where you have gravity to drain it out, and you could siphon the bottom of your tank just using tubing and no pump. But for me, I'm always working down on the sump, and that's where I do my vacuuming, and I, if you guys don't have this, you're making a mistake. It's so cheap, and it's so practical, and so useful, and clean out those little areas, and believe it or not, they even made a crevice tool. <laughs> Just like you have for cleaning the spot inside your car, there's one to get maybe between baffles. So that might be something you want as well. That one I haven't put on the website yet, but I got two or three in or four or five or something like that. I'll try to get it added to the site soon. And that way you can order that or you can just contact me directly and say, I want the crevice tool too. And I'll put it in your package and I'll just send you an invoice for the one item. Um, I want to tell you a story about yesterday. I got multiple things to tell you, but that's one thing. So I had to ship out two of these yesterday to a couple of customers. And I had this sitting on the table in front of me as I'm about to pack it. 
All that left, I was left to do is put the screw on here, and this holds your camera in place so that you can take pictures of your aquarium from above. And believe it or not, again, the anemone cube was overflowing. This is four times in two months when it hadn't done it once in eight years. And I'm just like so annoyed. Oh my God. So of course I stopped the flow to the pump. But as I turned to do it, I dropped a tape measure inside this box. And of course the part that hit with a little metal part and it put two dings in the viewing panel. The most important part of the whole box. We could have scratched any other part of it except for the viewing panel. So then I thought, well, maybe I can take a torch and kind of erase it. And all it did was bubble the acrylic. So I have this useless piece of crap right here, and I'm super annoyed about it. Now, I want to show you what I did to fix the anemone thing. Hang on. Let me grab my phone. I can't quite reach it. Still waiting for one of you to say, oh, this is what you got to do to fix your Nikon. All right, let's see. So... I can just pull this up here. Yes, I can. So this is my solution so the anemones don't get in my dorsal drain ever again. And it's probably long overdue. I never have had this problem before, and I'm just stunned that it keeps happening. And I keep pulling roses out of the overflow box. And I mean, I watch the tank daily to see if anything is getting near the, uh, you know, near the, the overflow teeth. And they're not. They're not there at all. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? So, you know, I'm, I'm just like, it's a normal day. Tank is normal. Next thing I know, pour, water's pouring over the walls. I'm like, wow. And I look in there, and there's a rose inside. It's like, really? So Dwayne thinks that because there's a lack of available space on the live rock in that tank, because there's so many anemones, they're looking for anywhere else to go. Could be true. That's probably a valid point um, or valid concern. I don't have an answer to it. All I know is I'm hoping that this perforated pipe that's one inch in diameter, and I could have made it longer too. I mean, I actually should have, but uh, I can take this Durso out once in a blue moon and clean off the intake, and this should keep the anemones out of there. It's so funny because the other end, the part that goes in the sump had a strainer on it, and I saw a little rose inside there, and I was like, are you kidding me, another one? So I um, put that piece of strainer in the anemone cube, and it's working its way out of the pipe now. But it's just, and so, you know, I don't know, maybe they're already in the pipe the whole time, you know, because when this thing overflowed the other day, there was one inside. And then when I went to deal with the problem, suddenly it wasn't there. And I had this really hard time believing that the anemone just slid all the way down the pipe so beautifully, like a, like a greased watermelon went through a, a drain pipe. You know, I'm <laughs> just like, what is happening? How can they move so quickly down the drain? Because usually they hold on to stuff. And, you know, even if there is suction, I don't think it was that great a suction. But anyway... Maybe not. Maybe there's been a few in the pipes and they just are gradually working their way out. And, and it's, mm. But, I mean, even Jack was like, ooh, Dad's having a bad day. And she ran away. <laughs> she, she went to the other room and she was like, I'm staying away from Mark right now. Oh, my God. He is pissed. But, yeah, I really was. I was really upset. And I was upset that I damaged the product I'm trying to ship. I have to make a new one. I can't use, sell that at all. And I have to... Um, well, I fixed that part on the drain, and I removed the strain on the other end going into the sump. I've just modified the plumbing to where it's an open hole. So if something wants to pour out, it's just going to pour out critter and all. And that should hopefully solve this once and for all until I replace the tank with a new set of drains where I'll have three drains. Um, because I really like that method, and I would like to go back to, I'd like to incorporate that in the anemone cube and just swap it out. So that is on my wish list of things to do in the coming, in, in the future. Um, I also want to talk about another product from VCA. So I got this guy a couple days ago. So this is the SPS kit. And inside of it, when you open it up, you'll see this little green, uh, like, strainer right there. And then as you remove the insert, you'll see the rest of the pieces right here. You have to very carefully, very, and this is brittle as can be, okay? Just very, very carefully. Brittle. <laughs> Pry that off gently. Here's your little 3D printed strainer. This is very important. Then you can remove this from the cardboard. And now you've got the fitting that your salinity probe for the apex will go into. And the probe will go in the top. 
through that little, there's an actually a little O-ring you can see. Probe sits in here, make sure the probe is clean. And then you will very cautiously put this into the bottom of the probe to make it hold you know, inside of it. And it creates a little bit of back pressure. And then you say, take some tubing, which there's some included, and hook it up to a very small pump, very small pump, or even off a manifold, but just a little bit of flow. I forget what he said. It was something really low, like a few gallons an hour, like three or four or seven or something, some really low number. Just a little bit of water going past the probe. And the benefit of this um, attachment that they've created is to make the salinity probe more consistent and not very like crazy inside your graphs. So I um, would like to share my browser. Let's see if it'll cooperate this time. Remember it wouldn't work for me the other day? And then I found I had to give it permission. <laughs> I was like, what? So we're gonna pull up my salinity probe graph. And this is actually the perfect time because you know next week it'll look really, really jagged. So let me switch to this. There's my graph. And motion, whoops, can't shove it up any higher. Anyway, um, you can see how it's a nice steady line versus the up and down those on the far left. And if we were to scooch over just a little bit, I can't see everything, you might have windows on top of windows here. If I were to scooch this over a little bit, like to here, you can kind of see this was the big water change and uh, working on the reef. And we go back here and it's pretty erratic. I mean, there's some serious things going on in the tank, you know, uh, measurement wise. But now with this, v, this VCA, Vivid Creative Aquatics SPS, which is the Salinity Probe Stability Kit, <laughs> you get a nice clean reading. So I wanted to let you guys know about that because if you're wanting to get one, you have to be gentle with it. And I think most people are not. I think everyone's like, well, I expect this thing to be bulletproof. I want it to be super strong and it's not. It's a 3D printed, very, very frail item. Matter of fact, because it is such a frail item, he includes a second one in case you're too rough. <laughs> so just think of it as like handling eggs, okay? Once it's installed, you're not going to touch it. It's going to be completely in the corner of your sump. Nothing's going to irritate it or yank on it or bump it until you do something. And so it should be fine. But adding these two little pieces of 3D printed material around that probe will help those of you, like myself, where the readings were all over the place. Other people have readings that are perfectly straight all the time without it. But this is just a kit they came out with. And I believe the kit's like about 30 bucks. And now you can actually use your Salinity Probe and trust the numbers, which is pretty nice. I've actually been in the camp where it's like, it says what it says and I really don't care because I just check my Salinity once a week with a refractometer. But it is really nice to actually be able to open up my, my Apex Fusion and look and see what the numbers are based on the, uh, the, the latest readings from the probe. <laughs> it still says error. Dang it. I have no idea why it messed up. Let's see. Um, what else can I tell you from this week? Because then I just want to talk about the reset itself. Um, I know we talked about some of this last week. Not everyone watches every single stream, so I'll kind of go into it. The reason that the reef needed so many corals pulled out was specifically to create more space, remove a lot of waste, um, and to uh, plant a few new corals to kind of change up the colors. Because what ends up happening, you, you know, well, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times I see other people do this. They put a whole bunch of uh, new corals in their tank. And I see it. I see like 60 frags, 80 frags. I'm like, yep, you're going to have 12. <laughs> because no matter what you want, there's going to be 12 or 6 that are going to dominate the tank and unless you're in there pruning all the time, you're literally going to have a few giant colonies and a few frags here and there. And for me, I watch things grow. I see how things get near each other. But for the most part, you know, I was able to have quite a few species in my tank. But there are so many types of SPS coral. And I've seen guys with tanks where everything's about the size of a lime. Little tiny mini colonies. And it's so colorful because they have like 90 different kinds. And it's really pretty. And they're all near touching each other, every single one of them. And, you know, eventually something's going to go wrong. And the worst part is with SPS, if the water just takes a nosedive a little bit, you can just have a wildfire work your way right through the tank and take out a lot of corals. Where LPS and softies, I mean, softies specifically, are super hardy and can handle pretty much everything you throw at them. But SPS is what I like. 
and I like a little bit of everything. So I have this time, I don't know how many corals are in here, but we've got a nice diversity. I will be working on the video to show the work we did. I know that some of you joined the membership tab on this channel, which is just, uh, oh, I'll throw it on the screen if I can find it. Overlays, there we go. See, it was hiding. So if I can find this thing. I can't find it, it's too easy. Well, I can create a new overlay if I can't find the old one. I'll just make a new one, no problem. Please stand by. So we would go to youtube.com slash reef slash join. And I'll make that kind of big so you can see it. And here you go. So that is what you would use to become a member of this channel. And the membership is just for extra perks. The channel is the channel. Everything continues as it is. But I did a few things. So like, for example, some of you were super excited to see that another stream was happening on Saturday. That was for members only. <laughs> and I saw a bunch of thumbs down come in when I said, sorry, guys, I'm switching this to members only. And I was like, argh. But I, um, I had promised it, and I had to fulfill that promise. And it's just a matter of making the software work with the streaming software. And I was trying, to, you know, first I tried sharing it unlisted and it didn't show up. So then I made it public and it showed up only for members. So the next time I said, okay, I'll just start with public. And it didn't work like that. It went to public. <laughs> I'm like, ugh. It'd be nice if there was like this bullet list of what order to do everything in. So it's just so streamlined and clean and precise. I really hate mistakes. But uh, the, the join thing is there's different levels, $5 a month, $8 a month, $10 a month. You know, you can pick one you like. I added a new one. Um, and it was a joke, but I loved it so much. I contacted the person that thought it up and said, I'm totally using it on YouTube. And she said, go ahead. So a friend of mine named Amy decided to do a live chat on Facebook um, for the women. Uh, it was literally, you know, women get together, let's talk about reef keeping. And uh, she said, you know, we're going to get together at this time and we're going to have a lot of fun. And then she had a title in the bottom of the screen. And no one saw it except for me. It said only fins which is a, a, a nod at OnlyFans. I was like, oh my God, OnlyFans, that's hilarious. And I laughed and you know, did the emojis and she said, you're the only person that noticed. <laughs> I was like, it's brilliant, I'm totally gonna use that. So I created an OnlyFans uh, membership on this channel that's $100 a month. And for the $100, you get a one hour phone call with me, direct one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's FaceTime, Skype, a regular phone call, whatever works for you to discuss your tank and to help you with it. And you know what? The nice thing about these memberships is you can cancel any time. So someone could join for the month and they get their phone call and then, you know, they can quit the next day. It's still active for another 29 days, but it's there available. If someone wanted some one-on-one -on -one help, I have made that available and we would schedule the day and time that works for you when we can speak. And of course, I'll follow up with you in emails and stuff, but you get a, a one-hour phone call. And that was my offer. And you might say, well, why is it so much? Well, I did some math, and I know that YouTube is going to take one-third of your donation. So that puts me around 65 70 bucks for the hour that I'm spending not doing other things. So I hope that you find that that's a fair rate for, you know, the amount of knowledge that's in my head. And if you need help with your tank, I can help you. And, you know, if you want to keep it going month after month, and every month I just keep following up with you, we can build a relationship. That's fine with me. Um, but So that's available for anyone that wants it. No one's being forced to do anything. I'm not going to suddenly no longer provide content. This is, we do the stream every Saturday at 2.08 Central Time. I still release videos when I have time to edit, which I'll be working on one uh, this week, obviously, because I want to share with you guys some nicer footage of the breakdown. And I downloaded all seven hours of the live streaming that we did f during the breakdown, which is like five or six gigs of a video and I'm gonna go through that and find some of the best parts and incorporate that too. So it should be a nice little video to show you what happened and the tanks transition and kind of show you the step-by-steps that we go through and the size of the corals and some of the things like that because I think it's kind of cool. Uh, one of the people asked me a week ago, how's your alkalinity working since you took out so much coral? Do you Did you have to adjust your calcium reactor? And I've been checking it and it went up slightly and so I adjusted the CO2 level 
to um, a slightly higher melting point, and today I'll check my alkalinity again and see how it's going. Last night I did a 50% water change on the frag system because I don't want those corals in there to die. People have been saying, are you selling frags? And I'm like, I don't know, if it lives, <laughs> and that's a really tough call. Now, that frag tank had a million Mahanos in it, and uh, we took out as many as we could. But last night I'm looking in the tank and I'm seeing a little one here, and seeing a little one there, and seeing a little one there. I want people to know if you end up getting frags from me, you need to look at these and study them carefully and, and look for any kind of pests because my tank is not pest free. I've never said it was. It's it's nothing bad because you've seen everything grows. But if you're, I don't want you to be mad and say, well, I got this from Mark and now I got this plague. I mean, you could not get from Mark and that's easier for you. <laughs> but if you want something from me, just double check it. You can dip. Um, I usually tell people that have just got a coral from me especially if I just cut it, I like don't dip it or anything the first week, but you have to, right? I mean, you have to be careful, but a brand new cut coral is going to be stressed. Now I ended up putting some frag or Dwayne helped me put frags on frag plugs. They've been sitting in there now for a week. Um, so they would actually be able to handle a dip without too much trouble. The big question is, you know, can we ship something to you during this massive heat wave and survive um, and get it on time? Will FedEx get it there the next morning like they're supposed to? Or will it show up a full 24 hours too late? So I've got, you know, I don't know, a small handful of people that wanted some of my corals and anemones. And if you would like to email me, I'm looking for this again. If you'd like to email me, you can email, email me sales at milosreef.com and put in anemone in the subject or something. So that way I will notice it. And um, I've had a few people say, you haven't sent me an invoice yet. And I say, no. I haven't sent you anything. I don't owe you anything at this point. All we've had is a conversation. <laughs> but uh, once you've sent money, then I have to take care of you, and I want to make sure that everyone's being properly taken care of. Uh, another idea that came up into my head when I was dealing with the memberships on YouTube, and I talked with another friend, with, with Ed, and I said to him, you know, it'd be kind of cool if I could do some kind of a coral pack. And he just said, you yeah, know, just make a coral pack on your website and then tell everyone on YouTube that way. And that way, there's an opportunity. So we'll see what happens with the reef tank over the next six to nine months. Um, for example, if things are growing really well in about nine months, I'll be trimming frags anyway. And that will be a much cooler time of year. It's a really good time to ship corals. So I would like to be able to do that for you and, and get some corals into your hands that came from my tank, if possible. And, you know, it probably would be something where... You get your pack and it's you know limited to, I don't know, there's six available or something, you know, and let's just say each one has six or eight corals in it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is all theory in my head. I'm not really a coral seller. I never have, well, I'm not. Uh, I never have been, but recently I did some stuff and I've got a whole little uh, mesh box inside the frag tank right now filled with those bubble tip anemones, those little babies that um, I call nano nems. So, I mean, there's a bunch of those to ship out if I can get them to you safely during the heat wave that is summer. Now, today is July 3rd in America, um, and that means that it's going to be 4th of July tomorrow. I just want to ask all of you guys maybe to water your lawns tonight, <laughs> um, just to be prepared, because when fireworks fall down near your house, it could cause a fire, and that is a risk. I, I know some places cancel fireworks uh, for safety reasons, like I was talking with a friend today who said up in Spokane they've canceled the fireworks show because of the risk of fire, because everything is just burned to a crisp already. Uh, from the intense heat and the lack of rain they've had. Well, that doesn't mean your nearby neighbors aren't going to set off small fireworks themselves and rockets and things that end up landing on your lawn. And year after year after year, I'm always like, oh no, we're going to do 4th of July and it has been so hot, it's been so dry. And today we had rain. <laughs> and I'm actually glad. I mean, that's only happened very rarely where we get rain on July 3rd. Happened a few years ago, and I was super glad it happened the day before because it meant everything was damp and uh, we'd be able to withstand some fires. But, uh, you know, not everyone's that lucky. So, you know, if you want to water your, your lawn and kind of look at anything you need to trim back that could po possibly be a risk, and keep your eye on things, you know, during the 4th so you stay safe and your tank stays safe and your home stays safe. So I want to bring that up. Now, I have two topics I want to talk about today. Um, one is about another YouTube channel. I was watching it. I'm not going to um, name the channel. I'm not trying to insult the person. I want to talk about the scenario. And maybe some of you saw the video, maybe some of you didn't. But it was brought to my attention. I decided to watch it. And I didn't watch every single minute. And it was like 30 minutes long. And I kind of jumped ahead a little bit here and there. So I didn't hear every word.
But basically, she wanted to remove a rose anemone about this big around, maybe this big around, in her tank that was in her rock work because she felt it was too big. And she wanted to uh, split it as well and then put half back in and sell off the other half. And when she did it, she had a plan. And I wanted to discuss what happened because there were certain things I would never have done. <clears throat> and I would like to discuss it with you so that way if you ever decide you want to do this, you have a little more insight. So first of all, the bubble tip anemone is well known to put its foot deep in a crevice in a rock, which makes it very hard to extract. There are a few techniques that can work to remove an anemone, one of them being turn the rock upside down and let the weight of the anemone pull on it so that it can start to come loose. Um, that's what she tried to do. She put it over a bucket with a couple of lids so it was propped and then anemone could dangle down, but I think it was hanging much, much, much too long. Uh, when I'm doing, when I remove an anemone from a rock, I have it off the rock within five minutes or less. If I'm working in the tank, it might take me forever because I'm trying to be so cautious and I can't really see what I'm doing. But if I'm out of the tank, four minutes, five minutes, done. I mean, the anemone is loose. Some techniques that work for removing anemones from rock would be to put a power head straight at it so the thing is irritated and it moves. And that would mean you have to do that for a couple of days. You know, you literally prepare for this event. Another choice is to put ice cubes near the foot. That makes it retract. And <laughs> our tanks are 78 degrees, so you have to keep putting an ice cube, put an ice cube, put an ice cube. And you might put 15 or 20 ice cubes so you finally get a good part of the foot off. And then you can get your finger under there and kind of pry it up because your finger is smooth. You might start with your nail. You might even trim your nails a little bit. But start it just a little bit because you don't want to tear the, the animal. And then get your finger underneath and just kind of work it off the rock as you slip your finger deeper and deeper into the crevice where the anemone is holding on. The uh, third technique would be to take a toothbrush and gently brush at the foot, kind of brushing upward, like you're brushing up from your gums, like the dentist always tells you to do, right? And you brush up and it kind of curls the foot up and it doesn't like it and it's kind of pulling away and it's like, what's happening? Now, once you've got, and then the, the fourth one or fifth, I've got, I have so many techniques. Another one's a credit card. I just get the very the rounded corner of a credit card under there and kind of work it up to pull some up. And then again, I switch to my finger and try to remove it. Another technique would be to use dental tools. They have all these different shapes, not the sharp ones, but they have like the dull kind of semi-round one. You can kind of work your way and maybe work your way an entire inch down the side or an inch and a half even. Keep prying up to get a little lip and get a little purchase and then kind of work a little bit more. And then maybe switch to the credit card and then get your finger in there and just remove it. So these are some things that work. And if you have to do it, and it's going to take you a while, you could even take a small bucket or a shallow bowl or a salad bowl, I don't know what, and put the rock with an enemy in it in the kitchen sink where you can see what you're doing. And it's underwater, so it's not going to be harmed. It's not out of water so long. So you have some options there. Then the next thing she did is where things went wrong. She mentioned that the anemone had turned rock hard and she didn't know why. She said it's, it's hard like a tree stump or a tree stalk. And she thought they were always soft and thought that was strange. And at that point, I definitely would not have touched that creature. <laughs> and I'm, again, I'm not insulting her. And she was very sad the way this thing played out because it didn't, it didn't end well. But she still chose to frag it, to cut it in half. And if I had gotten that anemone off of the rock, no matter how I did it, I would then put it back in a tank in a basket or a colander or something where it floats at the surface and can settle down for a day or days or a week where it has nowhere to go. It's in the basket. It's up near the light. It's getting some water. And you can kind of check on and do whatever you feel is the need to, you know, give it some fresh water because all it is is water that came through the holes. And if you have to, like, dip the bowl and lift it up, you know, and kind of down in the water to kind of flush that little compartment, you can. And that's what I'm doing with my little anemones in the basket right now. I, every day I turn it sideways and let it flush out all the crap and detritus that's in there and give it a good boost of fresh water and then I turn it back upwards so it cannot let them escape into that tank because I just went to all this trouble to remove them. I don't want them loose. Um, and so then after this anemone has been sitting for a while and is healthy and it's open and is calm, then if you absolutely need to frag one, there are videos of how to do this properly. And this is where she didn't. She actually just took it and just basically tried to cut it in half. And what you're supposed to do is go straight where the mouth is and cut outward and then go to the opposite side of the mouth and go the other direction. And now you have two halves. And then there's another thing you have to know. Once you have two halves, they have to heal. They need good flow. They need a lot of water. It's actually risky to take an anemone that you've cut in half and put it inside your tank again 
because all the stuff it's releasing in the water, when it's tearing itself in half to self-split, it's not releasing nearly what it does when you cut it in half with a razor blade. That is a completely different thing. And so people that propagate anemones will cut them and then put them in a totally different system with a whole bunch of water and they're keeping up with water changes. And the inside of that system is covered with like carpet, um, indoor, outdoor carpet. So the anemone can't hold on tightly. It kind of grabs on, but it, you can remove it easily for sale, um, for selling purposes. But for the average user, uh, I know one guy that went to a show where they demonstrated the cutting of the anemone in person and we all watched, and it was it was interesting. And then the, they put it in the raffle, and the guy won half of it. And then, you know, they pulled another ticket, and he won the other half. So he got both pieces. And he went home with these brand-new cut half anemones and put them in his tank. He didn't tell anyone he had a little tiny bio cube, and he killed the whole tank. I mean, everything died because it was just, that was way too much mass of stressed anemone in that little body of water. If he had a 90 gallon, 120 gallon, 180 gallon, might have gone much smoother. So in her case, she took the two different anemones and put them in a little tiny acclimation box with a lid to keep them contained that had all these holes in the side and put them in the corner of the tank. And basically, I mean, she didn't even show it, but I'm assuming they just melted away because she said they just got worse and worse and she waited way longer than anyone would wait, hoping beyond hope. It didn't work out. So we want to carefully remove it as quickly as we can. We then want to put it in something where it can calm down for days rather than immediately do the next step. And then finally, I wouldn't even cut it. I, in fact, one of the people in her uh, YouTube video comments said, I would have bought it for $300 from you. And she said it was on her biggest rock, her favorite rock in that tank. And I understand that feeling. I've, I've been like that too. But for $300, she could have sold him the anemone with that rock and got herself a really nice rock <laughs> and, you know, continued with her life and just not had the rose in there anymore. So these are some, I just want to discuss this because I know some of you guys watch different channels and some of you might even think, hey, I want to do something similar. So I want to kind of get into this topic a little bit to kind of give you some insight on how I would recommend you handle it versus um, just kind of guessing and hoping for the best because it did not work out well for her, unfortunately, or for the, for the animal itself. And... So that's that. And then the second thing I saw this week, what was it? I had both in my mind when I started this. No hints behind me? No, what was the other thing? Ah, it'll come to me. Ah, see, Nikolaj is saying that I should do a factor reset. I was looking for that in the menu. <laughs> I can't find it. Go to the top. Nope, it's not in that one. Let me shoot these menus really quick, trying to see if I can find the problem. It still says error. I know there's an option here because I've seen it. I just don't know where it is. Nope, it's not that one. I'm trying to think of that other topic that I want to talk about. on custom settings. It must be in here in setup menu. It's got to be that, right? Here we go. Reset all settings. Reset all settings. Terrifying. Are you sure? All right. I have now reset this thing. I'm trying to. Oh, I see. <laughs> Push the wrong button. All right, resetting all values to default values. Turn camera off. Okay, maybe we'll get our good camera back. Error, no! <laughs> ah! I don't know. <sighs> yeah, I'll have to, Rashawn says, check the connector of the lens to the camera. I actually looked at that as well. I don't know. I even switched lenses. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm very uh, annoyed. And the saddest part was I started early getting everything ready. I had everything put in place. All I did was turn on the camera and nothing was happening. I was like, what happened? What changed? But um, dang it. What was the other topic?
I can't think of it. All right, <clears throat> let's uh, go ask, answer some of your questions, guys. <clears throat> If you don't know this and you're new to this channel, uh, if you do at Milo's Reef in your comment, I see it better. You know, um, let me do this. Uh, one person just also said, it might have been the same person, said for me to format the memory card. There is one picture on this card I need. <laughs> let me grab it. Because uh, it is the picture of the reef before we broke it down. I took one photo. So let me go to Finder. I'll do that. Grab my NEF file. Okay, it's on my desktop. Oh, nope. I was going to say my clue is on my desktop, but no, it's not. Where's my picture I just saved? I'm trying to make sure I have this. Let's see, June 19th. June 19th? Is it really that long ago since we... All right, let's do a copy. Um, let's do both. Ugh. I'm even getting an error on this, trying to remove this one picture. Maybe the problem is the memory card. But the thing is, I got the error message when there was no card in there, too. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to waste your time. I'm just trying to solve the problem. I already did all the remove the batteries and put them in. I tried using something else, a different power source as well. And uh, not having any luck. So I'll go here. Again, too many things on my... I just share my desktop with you guys so you can see what I'm doing. <laughs> Let me close some extra boxes here so you can see. I'll go here. I'll switch to Lightroom. So here's Lightroom. Switch to library. Computer's going extra slow. Import. Extra, extra slow because I'm streaming, right? Now I'm here, I'm demanding it to do photography stuff. No photos found. All right, let's try this. There we go. Import. So this was the reef last week without photo editing. And uh, I don't think I need to work on this right now. But uh, all right, I got the picture. Now we can try to format that card. Let's see, I just don't expect any miracles here. But it's so weird. It went from working fine to just poof, it's not working. Error. Uh, some of the questions you might want to ask about would be, you know, things pertaining to resetting a reef. can't find format all right I'm not gonna waste my waste your time as I'm digging through a camera let me go ahead and bring your comments back on the screen all right Um, <laughs> Jeremy says, buckets are made of gold in this hobby, but I give you a bucket mark. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, Macy's daddy. Hope Macy's well. Jack is being really quiet for us, which is nice. Ah, camera could be stuck in live view mode. Well, I mean, I, I've tried a few things here. Uh, Alex says, how are your nitrates? And I did discuss this before. Last I checked was a few days ago, and they were orange, which is definitely past 40 and closer to 60. More than likely 60.
um, Emmanuel says, when you redid the plumbing on your sump, how long did you wait for the PVC cement to dry before restarting the system? I'm in the middle of a plumbing upgrade at the moment. Uh, I actually waited probably almost six hours, five to six hours. I, I really wanted it to be dry inside. One of the main techniques that I like to do when I'm doing the plumbing is I'll take the uh, pipe at the top and you know, way at the bottom, and I'll try and build that whole assembly but not connect the final points. And that way I can actually take it to the bathtub and run water through the pipe, or I can take it outside with the garden hose and shoot water through it to kind of rinse away any glue toxins, basically, is what I'm calling them, uh, just to remove that from the equation. And then I will glue the final points. And if you're not able to do that, you know, you have to glue something into something. If there's a union where you can still leave it wide open for air to kind of dry it for an hour or two, and then finally you union here and you union down below, it eliminates the whole series of pipes with all the glue just sitting there baking in its own fumes, so to speak. And then once you get water running through it, it'd be smart to run some carbon immediately on the tank to help absorb what was in the, uh, in the pipes, and that way you can have a good clean system. So that'd be my recommendation for that, and that's what I did. I, I like to wait a good long time. I know I talk with the fish store sometimes, and he says that um, he will do the plumbing, and and like within five minutes he turns it on. And I, I'm just I just don't do that. I take much longer, probably because I always have livestock involved, and it's not like I'm just putting together a tank and I'm going to add sand next, I'm going to add water next, kind of a situation. Branson, he's here from Dubai. Hey, Kat, I couldn't do what you had suggested. <laughs> I had too many issues happening over here right when I thought nothing would be a problem. Let's see. Trevor says, I'm here. What did I miss? The tank looks amazing and will grow in just fine. Did you get that new acro from the LFS? I actually got a few new acros from the LFS. I got something called T-Rex. Um, I got a Red Dragon and I got a Pac-Man. These were the three acros that are new to the tank. Plus, Dwayne had brought me something like eight or ten frags, and eight of them survived, and so those are planted in the reef as well. Hillbilly says, did you have to adjust your calcium reactor after the reset? Um, based on checking the alkaline frequently, I have not seen the need to make a big change, but I did adjust the melt point because I was creeping up on 10 dKH at like 9.5. So today I'll check again and see if I'm okay. I also um, got these new replacement tubes for the Versa pump, which is what I use to push water into the calcium reactor. And yes, I use the word push. I push it into the reactor, like every reactor we own. And uh, I want to replace that tubing. And they even come with a retaining ring now. And I want to calibrate and then you know move forward from that point, kind of just cleaning everything up and doing all, everything fresh. Hi, Thomas. Andrea's here, too. Kyle's here, too. Everyone's here. Team late. <laughs> um, Travis says, if the error persists or appears frequently, consult Nikon Authorized Service Representative. Yeah, I know. I saw that when I Googled it as well. <laughs> I was like, come on. This can't be this. So it's just weird that it went from working fine to suddenly doesn't work at all. And I don't know what, what changed, so i got to figure it out. Uh, CT says, siphoning the sand bed or not? What are your opinions? With a deep sand bed, I don't recommend it. With a shallow sand bed, you can. And it's because the deep sand bed, you're supposed to have an area that's deep down below that's anoxic and that helps to consume nitrate. And you would think with my nitrate issues and the amount of sand I have, I'd be fine. But clearly my sand bed's not deep enough to do the job adequately. So we have been pulling out, um, you know, I say we, Dwayne and I, took turns gravel vacking all the sand we could reach. And, you know, we didn't get it all. We got a lot. And odds are if I went there and did it again today, I'd pull out even more brown sludge. But the tank is eight years old, coming up in November. And in that eight years, a lot of waste has hit that tank. And actually one of the things would that Dwayne mentioned, which surprised me as well, and now that he's mentioned it, I'm kind of looking around like, huh, I don't see any bristle worms in my tank at all. So maybe the copper band ate them all. I don't know. But I have just like a couple of cucumbers, a few hermit crabs, a few snails. Actually, my tank could use a, a nice, um, 
I'm trying to think what we used to call that. There was a thing you could do. You could add some live sand, and you could add this and add that, and kind of increase your your biological filtration in addition to a cleanup crew with sand conks and cucumbers and, and you know different and nasarius snails. We did find a few large Tongan nasarius snails too. But um, yeah, it, there's not like a big huge diversity of bugs in my tank, and there's not even a, lot, a bunch of bugs in the refugium either. Macy's daddy says, "Do you feed your anemones?" No, I don't actually directly feed them. I have been squirting food at these since they're in a basket and they can't just opportunistically catch anything because the basket is like a mesh material. And because it is so tightly woven, the uh, I'm lucky water's passing through it. <laughs> I'm actually worried about it. That's why I keep turning it sideways, let water flow in and then flow out just, just in case to make sure they're okay. And they're fluffing up and they look okay, but you know, I'm just being a little bit worried. Maria says, you might have to service your camera. I just bought it! Used. So, I guess I might have to. Grrr! I just don't get it. Um, thank you for all these suggestions. And yes, Hillbilly Reefer, I do have the replacement tubing. So, if you need that, let me know and I can get one to you. Adam says, do you ever think about setting up a new tank somewhere else in your house? Yeah, those thoughts cross my mind. But then it becomes another tank I have to take care of. And that kind of squashes it pretty quickly. But it would be kind of neat. It would be nice to do something different. Um, this is not what I was going to tell you guys about before. But uh, there's a guy in club in, a, in the DFW Mass Club, Dallas-Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society, who posted a thread on DFW Mass, man, like a year ago, a year and a half ago. He wanted to create a giant reef in his backyard. And I was like, wow. And then he talked about what he wanted to do and how he was going to take hundreds of feet of PVC pipe and he wanted to make a thermal heater for under the slab of concrete to warm the tank from beneath rather than going through like some kind of inline heaters or whatever. Anyway, uh, I thought, well, that's really ambitious. He had like a, a drawing of what he wanted to be like and had windows in the side and all this stuff, all right? He's been pouring concrete. It is happening. <laughs> it's like 10,000 gallons. It's huge. And he's, uh, I actually uh, asked him a question on the thread yesterday to see, you know, what his completion date hopefully might be. You know, when does he think he'll get done with the construction part to where he gets to the fun part? And, oh, man, if that thing comes to fruition, that is going to be really cool. Um, it's going to be a slow process, and he's going to, the biggest challenge with giant tanks is when you put corals in there, you can't tell you put any corals in there because it's so big that everything is just a dot. And, you know, when I go shopping and I see a frag this big, I'm like, what's the point? I'm never going to see it again because my tank's seven feet long and three feet wide. And it needs to be sizable to when you stand back from three feet, you can see the darn thing. So uh, he'll, he'll have to get rock, a lot of it, and he'll have to get some large corals. Uh, I would think... Some really good things would be like some big old gorgonians and sea fans from Florida, for example, because they, they're they big. You can see them from a distance, and there's some motion. It looks nice. Uh, I don't know. We'll see where he goes with this whole thing, but uh, I look forward to giving you guys an update on that as it, as it keep, continues to go along. Kyle, thanks for becoming a member. I appreciate that. Um... Nick says, should we plumb our RODI system? This thing is in the wrong spot, and it's definitely a little too big. Here we go. Should we plumb our RODI before or after the water softener? And also, any issues with plumbing the auto water change discharge into the lawn? Uh, definitely after the water softener is best for the RODI system because it will work less hard. Because whatever's coming out of your pipes is so hard, you need a softener. <laughs> so let the softener do the bulk of it. Put the RODI after that. And then, yes, the output, the waistline of the RO system can definitely go to your lawn, to your foundation, to flower beds, something like that. Just nothing for human or pet consumption is the recommendation. Um, Luca says, how do the new acros react to your huge nitrates? <laughs> they actually were okay. It's, it's weird. And you know what? Dwayne told me, he says, I have not checked nitrates in two years. I'm like, well, then maybe your nitrates are 82. <laughs> I don't have any idea. 
but uh, his corals, I mean, there's a green slimer right there in the middle, that, uh, right there, that he brought me. There's something green in the back. He had names for all these things. I can't remember what he called that. And then, you know, this one right here in the front is a Montipora that has uh, some little red polyps. Actually, I didn't change the color of the tank tonight, uh, today. Why don't I do that? Maybe it'll look a little bit better for the stream. Maybe it won't. Let me change that for you. I forgot all about it because I was so frustrated that the camera wouldn't do its job. All right, so we will go to... <clears throat> Turn this to auto and turn this to streaming. And kind of loose. Oh! See? Yeah. Doesn't look right. It looks too bright. Actually, let's find the way it was. What if we just switch it back? Or what if I do this? Let's pick a different one. Try this. Turn this one back off. It's too blue. Turn this off. You know, it was actually kind of okay where it was. <laughs> I'll leave it the way it was. All right, whatever. Uh, if we'd had the nice camera, we would have had much better footage for today. I have no idea why it decided to break. But it is what it is. Let's see what's going on over here. I'm looking at your comments down here on the iPad because it highlights my name in red. It's like, oh. And a lot of them are about the camera. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, <clears throat> Adam says, what are your thoughts on clownfish harem tanks? Uh, they're very specific, actually. I highly recommend that if you're going to do a harem of clownfish, that they be all of the exact same clutch, rather than trying to grab some of these and some of those and, and mixing them all up. They don't do well in large groups. So if you were to, you know, if you're mixing them up. So if you said, I want some puzzle pieces and some snowflakes and some bullet holes and some this, they're all oscillaris, but they're all different strains from all different families, and they will all duke it out. And you'll be constantly removing one more clown, removing another clown, saving a clown is what you're doing. You're carefully taking them out because they're not being tolerated by the rest. And unfortunately, once one fish attacks another fish in that bully attitude, the other fish just join in the frenzy and attack it, even though they don't care. They were fine until they saw this activity, and then they, like, get involved. And so I, I typically recommend, if you can find someone that breeds clownfish, to go ahead and ask them for like how many you want that are six months old and hopefully they're about an inch long and then put them all in the tank at once and if you do that then you can have them long term now the only clownfish species i'm aware of that naturally works as a harem would be the skunks and i have 11 skunk clownfish in this tank that i've had for about four or five years now and i still have all 11 and there's the biggest one all the way down to the smallest one they are, actually do a stair-stepping hierarchy and that is literally how they are and if you ever see them in public aquariums you ever see them in someone's reef tank it's just like that i'm describing there'll be from the largest to the smallest and there'll be a group and they they do seem to do well harmoniously there's some skirmishes but it's not the all-out war of mixing clowns if um if you do choose to do a pair of this and a pair of that and a pair of like maroons and and saddlebacks and uh the blue stripe and you'll end up with a pair of clowns and everything else won't make it. So I, I just don't recommend anything other than getting either, hair, you know, these, the skunks, which there are pink skunks and then there's tangerine skunks. Those are two very nice, friendly species, never bite you. You can work in the tank all you want. And the, uh, the idea of getting some tank raised all from the same clutch of eggs is the other approach that I recommend. Billy says, is it okay to plumb the wastewater from an RODI into the swimming pool? You know, I uh, would like to think you can, but according to health code, you're not supposed to. Now, that being said, people do it anyway, because usually in a swimming pool, you're running chlorine, and so whatever might be in that water would be eliminated. So it's probably fine. Uh, I know some people take the wastewater and send it to their pond where they have some fish, 
and that seems to work. The, the thing about the waistline coming out of the RODI system is the RODI took out all the best water, and what's left over is the waste or the brine, and it is concentrate. Whatever was in the original water, it is much more concentrated now in that waistline. And while people think, oh my god, I can't stand that I'm wasting so much water, it's not that much water. It seems like a lot of water, but it's not. If you were to count all the water you use during a shower, or the laundry, or washing dishes with the faucet running, or washing your hands with the faucet's running, all those things that we do, we just consume water. But we are not using like thousands of gallons of water just to make RODI. That's just not the case. And most people that get a system and start making water at home might notice that their their bill bumps up like five dollars a month or something. My own house, everything in my house, all my reef tanks, all the top off that I'm doing, and the occasional water changes, and during the and I'm alone, the uh, with showers and laundry and dishes and uh, flushing the toilet a million times, <laughs> you know all the things we do. Um, my water bill is like about $69 a month in the winter, and it's about $85 in the summer when I'm running the sprinklers nonstop. So it, and the RODI is constantly you know, being used either to make drinking water for me for coffee and tea. I have a spigot on my sink, which you can actually see right there. Um, and then the um, once a week, I fill up the two top-off containers. And then when I have to make a ton of RODI to make salt water for the water changes, I have to make 250 gallons of RODI, so it means 750 went down the drain. So being able to use it somewhere else is wise, and it's nice. Um, and if you can use it in anything around your property, that would be great. Uh, you can wash your car with it. You can wash clothes with it. it. It just comes down to the hassle factor. What are you willing to put in a bucket and carry to what spot? Or where are you going to run a tube to? And then also, the tubing coming out of your RO system should not go more than 40 feet. So if you are trying to run it like 100 feet, you're putting back pressure on the membrane. So you would want to put it like from the RO into a PVC pipe and then let gravity take that water all the way to that swimming pool you were mentioning, for example. Um, something that we came across in the frag tank that I told you is just, I mean, it, we nickname it the frag tank of death because things just didn't do well in there. Um, I could never get the water stable in there. I could never get calcium down from 600. Uh, as we took out the rock and were cleaning it, we found some of the rock was highly suspect. But something was wrong with it. It wasn't even the right color. It looked like rock, but then when we, you know, he, uh, Dwayne put it through bleach, he put it through uh, muriatic acid, it was brown, and we've never seen brown live rock. There's nothing comes out of the ocean that comes out brown. It's very weird. And then those areas that were really white, and we were just like, what is this stuff? So we didn't use that. And when I check the calcium level in the frag system now, it's like 410, which is great. <laughs> and that's what it needs to be. The uh, thing is, a lot of times we are using different products from different sources and different resources. And that rock was given to me by a new vendor who says, hey, I'm selling rock and sand and you know, I'm getting off the ground. I'd love for you to try it out. And so I set up that tank with it years ago and I never initially never thought that was a problem. It looked like rock. I was like, okay, fine. It just was dry. And you guys know I love live rock. I was like, okay. So I put that in there, and then for like the first nine months or so, the tank was fine. But then the numbers just wouldn't level out. It's like I overdosed calcium, but I didn't. And, I mean, I, I couldn't have because the numbers kept rising, and yet I wasn't putting any more in. I, st I stopped adding calcium so long ago, and the numbers stayed around 600 the entire time until we broke the tank down. So the, um, the point is, is that if you're thinking about using something and you're like, well, if I can get this from the quarry or I can get this from a pond supply, or whatever, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should save yourself some heartache and literally get something that is being sold in this hobby for the aquarium, even if it costs you a little bit more than you're thinking. Um, in that case, if I had any clue that his rock might have been suspect, it didn't even dawn on me that could be a thing, I would have just said, no, thanks. And I would have just moved on with my life because it's been so frustrating. Anything I tried to put in there didn't do well. The only things that handled it were fish and anemones. Um, but anything else I put in there really didn't do well. I mean, I put fungias in there. They went away. I put in gorgonia. It went away. I put in a couple of frags occasionally, they, like Monty that came out of my tank. And I thought, well, I'll put it over there. It just died. So that tank really had a major problem. And uh, right now, it's not perfect. I mean, because we did a reset, we really threw everything into it 
into what could essentially be almost a brand new setup. I mean, we still had the skimmer, we still had the refugium area with rock in it, but you know, we put in brand new water, we put in brand new sand, and uh, you know, I actually was adding prime to the tank several times this week just to lock up anything like ammonia or um, uh, with nitrate, nitrite, all that kind of stuff in case I was trying to cycle. Which normally I wouldn't think a tank would cycle with all the livestock, but there's probably a chance that it was trying. Um, but at this point with all the prime I put in there, it's kind of impossible to do an ammonia test and get an accurate result. <laughs> Michael says, I've never seen you so caught up on the comments before. It's because I can't think of story number two I want to talk about. I'm so aggravated. It's going to come to me after I t turn this thing off, of course. Let's see. Nick says, we've had live life rock cycling in a Rubbermaid for the last few months, and I put bio bricks in from our existing tank in a Rubbermaid. Any other things we should do to help cycle the new tank? You could put in live rock enhance, which adds some nice bacteria to the rock you've been uh, uh, fermenting in the Rubbermaid vat. Uh, live uh, rock enhanced can also be used in your main tank. And then there's also the choice of using the product from Brightwell that is a dry rock starter kit, but your stuff's not dry. So I don't know that you're going to need that. Uh, I know some people like to use Turbo Start from Fritz for new tank setups. I actually put some Prodibio in the frag system just in case it could use an infusion of fresh bacteria on top of everything we did over the last week. Because, you know, a little bit more is always okay as long as you don't overdose anything. No, I still can't think of it. Wow. I keep thinking it's going to come to my mind. It's like, oh, this. Like, no, I talked about that. Oh, this. No, I talked about that too already. I don't know what it is. Uh, Steven, Steve says, I currently have 70 PSI on my RODI system. Would I get better production with a booster pump or would it not be worth the money? At 70, you're kind of there. I mean, if you got a booster pump, it might push you up to 90, 95, even 100 or higher. And your membrane can handle the 100 PSI. It will become more efficient, but I guess really what you need to do is look at what is the TDS coming out of the membrane now to decide if it's worth the effort. Because a booster pump kit, which I sell, is $115, and if you're, you know, if you're, let's say it's 100, you, know, you didn't say what size it was, but if it's a 100 gallon a day system, or a 75 gallon a day system, those are usually, those are usually 98% rejection rate. So of 100 TDS, you should be getting two out of the membrane under ideal circumstances, which this time of year with the water a little warmer, the, the PSI is up. If your TDS out of the tap is less than 200, you should essentially get maybe two. But if it's coming out 10, for example, then yeah, the booster pump might get you all the way up to 98% rejection rate, which would be less TDS coming out of the membrane, which means the DI resin would last longer, so it's totally worth the money. But the question is, do you need it? So I would look at your TDS coming out of the membrane to decide if you want to spend the money to do that. And then if you decide to get a booster pump, and a lot of people make this mistake, you install the booster pump right before the membrane, not in front of the whole RO system. You don't want to go booster pump, sediment, carbon, carbon, membrane, DI. You want to go sediment, carbon, carbon, booster pump, membrane, DI. And the reason being is that the membrane is in a PVC housing that can handle that additional PSI where the acrylic housings underneath that are clear or clear-ish, they aren't designed for that much pressure and they could rupture and crack. Uh, Adam says, so does that mean I should just do a skunk clownfish harem tank? That'd be easier. Yes, it would. And that'd be perfect if you could just do that. There's a guy out of Florida that grows tons and tons of clownfish. Uh, Miguel Hurtato or Guato or something like that, something close, Puerto or something like that. He grows thousands and thousands of clownfish. And see, that if I was looking for a clutch, I would reach out, for example, to him. But yeah, you can, uh, when I got my skunks, it was uh, just uh, an opportunity that fell in my lap, which was unintended. And, uh, but Sustainable Aquatics had a bunch of them tank raised. And so I was very excited to get those. Sharks says, my wife and I were wondering where you would recommend buying fish. The closest store is two hours away. We want a powder blue tang and have had terrible luck with, um, with them from the LFS. 
and I do quarantine. Powder blue tangs are already kind of hard in the first place. They're not hardy. <laughs> They're just hard. And they tend to be ick magnets. And so there's a chance that, you know, I'm glad you're quarantining. You may have to literally treat specifically to keep that fish healthy. It's got to eat. It's got to be very active. The tank has to be big enough for that fish. You could try Live Aquarius Diver's Den because their fish are supposed to be um, in tanks being fed and observed for something like 14 or 21 days before they sell them. So they're a little bit more guaranteed. And then they have, a, as far as I know, a 14-day guarantee. Now, there's been a lot of changes in uh, this industry in the last year. And, you know, Petco bought this and then so forth and so forth. And these people are no longer with the company. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on with Diver's Den right now. But that has always been the place to go to, and uh, that's where I like to get fish. There are a few other online vendors. Uh, the other choice would be other stores. And like you said, the one you go to is two hours away, which is a long drive, and I get it. If you're going to like a bigger city, it might be worth traveling to multiple stores in that city and kind of just, just having the you know, make it a day. Sounds like work, but it's actually kind of fun. <laughs> And the thing is, you're behind the wheel a lot. But if you're with your wife and you're taking turns, and if, she, you know, if you both enjoy the hobby equally, it might be kind of a fun one-day thing to do, and you can come home with some cool stuff. Uh, Alex says, would the brown on the rock be iron precipitation? There were parts of the rock where there was, like, black flecks in it. And there was another brown rock. It was just brown. I, I almost wanted to just break it in half and see if the whole thing was brown through and through. But, you know, Dwayne and I both said, I've never seen rock look like this before, and I couldn't disagree with him at all. He was 100% right. So um, that one, I don't think it had, you know, Alex says, did it have a name? You know, was it some brand? Whoever that vendor was, you know, he, he came out of the woodwork, you know, and he said he wanted to do this. And I think we knew each other for a while, and then I just never heard from him again. I don't even know if he's still around. I don't know if he's selling something entirely different. But I don't think he's selling the sand and rock that I got because I think more people will be talking about it. Uh, you know, me, I, I tend to set something up and leave it alone forever. So something that I got from him four years ago may be, you know, ancient history in this industry. Hey, Thomas, congratulations. It's nice to hear that your tank is coming up on a one-year anniversary. Um, Omar says, does Brightwell coral amino acids raise nutrients? I've been dosing it every day the past few weeks, and now I have tons of green hair algae on my sand bed. Um, amino acids don't add nutrients, I don't think. I'm sorry, this is not a strength of mine, this one piece of knowledge, but as far as I'm aware, amino acids are used as a triggering response to make corals eat. And so people would put in amino acids in the tank, and then 15 minutes later, they'd feed the tank and everything's ready. So I don't think it's doing it. You may want to use a little bit less, you know, if you're dosing it daily. Myself, I dosed Acropower for a while there because Dwayne loves it. And so I thought, all right, let me hook up a dosing pump. And I was pumping in 80 milliliters once a week. And I never saw a difference. I mean, my corals grew. So I, <laughs> they always grow. They grow in spite of me. So what can I say? I, I don't know that it makes a difference. And I remember there was a poll a long time ago in the chemistry forum, and it said, you know, if you've used amino acids, you know, what has been your reaction or what is your, your experience? And 50% said, what a difference. And 50% said, made no difference. So I don't know if that's changed, you know, since that one poll forever ago, if people feel way more strongly about amino acids than they did in the past. I myself have, you know, tried to hit or miss. I didn't really, I think if I just dumped in the tank nonstop, and I mean the right amount, but I think if I used it a lot, I could say, wow, that made a big difference. Or maybe I'd say, <laughs> maybe I would say, I can't tell the difference. I don't know. But in the meantime, your green hair algae problem you have to solve. Now, um, there are a few ways of solving it. You said it's on the sand, which means you could pretty much take like a, a, a net and you could scrape the skim the surface and kind of take that away. Um, you're definitely gonna need some cleanup crew in that tank soon before this gets everywhere and on the glass and on the rock and on the corals. So don't let that get away from you. But uh, cor green hair algae comes from a few things besides what you're thinking. Just the dosing of amino acids it comes from light. It comes from nutrients, and uh, it comes from something else in your tank where it got started. It doesn't just magically appear out of nothing. It came off a frag, it came out of some water, a tendril came off of something, 
and land in your tank and has been spreading. So you're going to want to remove what you can before it gets away from you. Another thing that you could do is possibly um, use a product called Flux RX that I sell in my shop. It gets rid of green hair algae and it's just a medication you put in the water and you turn off your skimmer for three days to a week and the stuff just dies. So I mean that's another option that you may consider if you feel so inclined. Uh, Steve says he has a 75 gallon a day membrane and he's getting two. It's working perfectly. I would leave it alone. Uh, you might get a little faster water, Steve. In other words, instead of getting three gallons an hour, which I think is right for 75, you might push up to four gallons an hour, so it might be a little quicker. The, I don't think your TDS is going to drop to one. <laughs> eh, it might, but uh, other than that, I don't think you need it. you got the PSI, you got the low TDS, I would probably just keep using it the way it is. Uh, Jay says, my uh, TDS comes out 7 to 8, but I have 400 TDS, which means 2 per 100, which is about right. And uh, so that's not even a surprise, Jay. That's exactly where I'd expect it to be. And Alex says, can we use the leftover water from the RODI waste to water plants? Yes, you can. Uh, Jake says, do you look at other reef-oriented YouTube channels for quick advice or quality advice and inspiration or inspiration? Um, no, I'm so darn busy. I mean, what happens is YouTube will give me suggestions. And in this case, I was in a private chat and someone said, did you see this video? And uh, I had not. And I thought, well, let me go check. Just like two weeks ago, someone said, did you see this video? And I was like, what? <laughs> and I had to see it. And... Uh, I really did not expect to like the video because the topic kind of went against everything I believe in. It said everything you need to know, I think it said everything, maybe it did, maybe it said 80% of everything you need to know in reef keeping can be explained in 10 minutes flat. And I was like, what? I mean, we do these super long live streams and you're still learning. <laughs> like, how can he cover it all in 10 minutes? And I was like, no way. So I watched it, you know, with my eye twitching, expecting to say, I knew it. But he actually was really accurate. And he did say there's a ton that you need to know. That other that other 20% is so important and it's going to take a lot of homework. But these basics, he was right. And I was like, all right, I give it to him. I give him a thumbs up. <laughs> so, but inspiration, no. I've had, I've been in this hobby since 97. And I've seen a lot and I go, I guess my inspiration comes from going to trade shows like MACNA, where I get to learn from speakers, um, and that's where I get, or even Coral Magazine, where I get to read articles and get some additional knowledge. I have so many books on my shelf that I've acquired over the years and never really just sat down and read it cover to cover like I should. And I keep thinking I should do that. But when do I have the hours in the day to do that? I just don't. I even, you know, last night I tried to watch one episode of something with a lot of pausing as I was doing three other things. So, you know, when... I, I usually, you know, my inner circle knows this. I tell people, what do you mean you're bored? How is it possible to be bored? I have so much to do all the time. It never stops. But um, I would love to just have a day where I can just veg out and do nothing at all and uh, and be bored. <laughs> it's, I don't know how you do it. I actually need to find out what boring is like. I, I don't know. The word makes no sense to me. Richard says, how old is your NASO? 17 years in my care. Got her in 2004. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, she was probably two or three years old before I got her. So she could be about 20 years old. Kareem says, how would you cycle 10,000 gallons of the concrete rock and sand? Man, I have no idea. I literally don't know enough about what he's doing. But wow, he has got a heck of an endeavor going on. Brazil! <laughs> Uh, Matt says, aminos do much more than forcing corals to eat. It's a pretty complex topic. Yeah, I need to know more about it. I just don't know enough. I said that. I said, I don't know. So I need to learn more about that. I think it's one of those things that I learned a little bit and forgot it. Um... Looking for another question here. Let's 
So 19 says, I don't know why my corals are not fully opening or are dying. I have LPS, like hammers that are suddenly dying. Torches seem to be okay. My parameters are fine. Uh, nothing's wrong besides nitrates are a little high. Uh, my tank has been doing the exact same thing this year. I've lost quite a few hammer polyps, and I couldn't put my finger on what was going on, and I kept blaming my nitrates. So when we did the clean out, we saved all the, ones, all the heads that lived, but... Um, Will some of them still die? I don't know. Will what we cleaned out and lowering of the nitrate be enough to solve the problem? I hope. I want to continue to work on lowering those nitrate uh, in my system as much as I can to hopefully uh, just watch corals grow and be happy. And when I give a frag to someone else, it doesn't go from my high nitrate into their tank of low nitrate and put the coral in shock. So I'd like to, I'd really like to put this behind me. And you know, people have all kinds of opinions and I get comments all over the place. I get them on Instagram, and I get them on Facebook, and I get them here on YouTube. And they say, why haven't you just solved this nitrate thing by now? You've been talking about it forever. Well, keep in mind that I also like to try out different products that are on the market to see if they work as they are promising to, so I can say, yes, I used it, and it worked. And I've been very frustrated that I've tried two or three things already that are well-known products, and none of them put a dent in my nitrate. I mean, they didn't even bring them down a, a, a scotch, nothing. It was just like my nitrates did not care. They were bulletproof. And the product would work. Clearly, it was doing something because it would bottom out my phosphate, but the nitrate wouldn't budge. And I used different nitrate kits. So, And before you're like, well, you know, you're using API for nitrate. I had ELOS, which only goes to 25, and it was fuchsia, which is beyond the highest that kit can go. I have um, salifert which I have found notoriously hard for me to read from the inception of time. And so it's not my favorite kit, even though I used it for a long time. But I remember going to Magna and the owner of the company said, Mark, you're still doing that kit wrong. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'd look down from above. He goes, no, you look from the side. You divide by 10. I'm like, <sighs> so anyway, I own it. Don't use it. Um, I tried some other kit. And then I recently got a new API kit because that one measures all the way to 200. And it gave me these, it said, I was like 10. I was like, well, that's a lie. And I tried shaking the crap out of those bottles and doing another test and it measured 40. And I said, well, that's a lie. <laughs> so I took the kit back and got another brand new kit. And uh, that one measured like 80, like I thought. And then after all the work in the tank, it's down to 60. And then I had someone telling me on Instagram, well, Mark, why are you trusting API? It'll never give you accurate numbers. Like, you know what? It can handle the high numbers. When I need low numbers, then we can talk about some other device, whether it's the HANA brand new high resolution nitrate checker, or if I can go back to ELOS where it measures zero to 25 and somewhere in that range. I'd love to be in that range. It's not like I don't want to be. I've had the one thing that's been mentioned to me multiple times has been a sulfur denitrator. And that's the one thing I haven't tried. So it seems like a logical direction to go with next and just hook that up and let it work its magic. And then if I can have that running continuously and keep the numbers nice and low, then I could start dropping in more fish. Speaking of more fish, it was really funny. Dwayne was sitting here in the living room, and I had to feed the fish at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And when I put food in the anemone cube, all these clowns came out. And he's like, I didn't know you had all those fish in there because you never see them. All you see are tentacles. But there's 12 large clowns in there, and uh, there's three Bengais and two gobies. And so that's... Uh, 17 fish in there that's tied into this reef and then this tank behind me probably has another 30 fish so i've got close to 50 fish that i'm feeding in the system uh, every single night but i'm only feeding once a day with frozen foods that i thaw out and from sporadic times i occasionally do with some a little piece of banana and then not nearly enough i do some nori <clears throat> I'm reading part one and part two comments from Luca. <laughs> he said, I was away from the tank for two weeks. I couldn't find a local hobbyist to look after the tank. So I asked a family friend every time they got in the garage where the tanks are, if he could look at them. And the camera would get notifications when they'd get in. Today they tested the water's KH and it was a little bit lower. So they raised it up, dosing everything. It's going great so far. 12 more days to go. Oh my God, you must be so stressed. That is hard when you're asking someone else to watch your tank that's not a regular hobbyist. Here we go. Metricat's chiming in. 
Amino acids are the building blocks of all corals. Brightwell Coral Amino is not intended to add nutrients to your tank, but if you're overusing it, maybe your corals are not taking it all up. All right, that sounds good. Thanks, Kat. Appreciate that. Uh, Adam says, what are your thoughts on buying fish from Petco? I've never had any problems with them, but I've heard a lot of people over the years complain about Petco fish. Most people complain about Petco's fish section, and they just can't stand how it's set up. They don't like what the water looks like. They don't look like what the tanks look like. But they're so happy to get something for nothing. They'll see something in there. The employees don't know what it is. Like, oh, yeah, that's a goby. And, you know, it's not. It's an angelfish. And they will uh, get a deal. And then they'll brag about it on the internet. Like, oh, I got this fish for $7 at Petco. They didn't even know what it was. All right, you ripped off Petco. Good job. <laughs> I, uh, I have bought a few things from Petco. We, Caitlin and I bought a aero crab while we were there. I just like, oh, I have to have one. And it didn't live three days in my tank. And I assumed it was the nitrate. You know, it's just too high for that invertebrate. And everything else in my tank is just used to the numbers. And so I'm not actively trying to add more livestock to my system. I'm trying to correct what is wrong. So it, leaves, it gives me the opportunity to add new things in the future. Uh, Advanced Pest Control says, I normally listen while driving to work. Any advice on catching a bicolor angel? It's, begin, it's uh, taken a nipping at my corals. Thanks in advance from the UK. Um, a fish trap is the best approach to removing a fish from your system. There are a couple other methods. It depends on what size your fish is. I'm going to assume it's not tiny. Um, but one thing you could do, which is really fast, and uh, hopefully the fish is not tucked into a rock. Sometimes they do that when they want to hide. You can drain a lot of water out of the tank till it's about this shallow, and the fish are kind of like moving around like worms, <laughs> slithering around, and you can scoop them right out of the tank. You could try to herd it into a clear object, like a glass or a vase or something, with a net, and it'll swim in, can't see it, and then you can flip it up and remove it, and then refill the tank rapidly. That's one approach for removing a dwarf angel, but the fish trap is usually the best approach. I have seen some people actually sitting, it's, it's a picture, and it's probably true, but they're with a fishing rod and a hook, <laughs> trying to catch a fish out of their tank. But uh, those are, my approach would be to use a fish trap or use a net, and lower the water level. The lower you take, I mean, take all that water you tank, you pump it out into all the containers, <laughs> and then you remove the item, and then you pump the tank full again, the tank was without water for 10 minutes, maybe, because you're pumping it. And then when you're pushing water back in, uh, a trick that I use is I will put the nozzle of the hose into a filter sock, like a fine mesh bag. You know, not mesh, uh, a fine fuzzy felt bag, you know, the one that's very low micron because it's very dense. And then the water flows out of the sock, but it doesn't blast anything. It doesn't move your sand, but it doesn't hit the LPS corals and tear them rather than just pumping directly at your rock work. So that might be something you could do if you're doing what I'm describing. Um, I'm learning about amino acids from you guys. Thanks so much for your comments. He said, Alex says, amino acids add nitrogen. Problem is that people start to add and sometimes they don't see any immediate results so they add even more. And then he said, another thing that we normally would need that we normally would need much less than what they recommend to add. It would depend on what they have in the bottle because it might have other chemicals besides the amino acids. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you can do, and he's saying great tip is to add small amounts. Turn off the skimmer for three to five hours and turn it back on because the skimmer could remove it. Um, whenever you're adding anything to your tank, like there was someone on this channel who I'm friends with on Facebook, and she used the reef chemistry calculator and she wanted to increase her alkalinity or she wanted to adjust alkaline calcium and magnesium. And she had the numbers the calculator said, and she said, I need to put in this much, but I'm really nervous. And I said, well, no, you don't need to put in that much today. You need to put in that much over the next duration. So for example, let's say that it said she needed to add 100 milliliters of calcium. No, let's take an easier number. Let's say she had to add 70 milliliters of calcium to the tank to get it from where calcium is now to where she wants it to be then put in 10 milliliters a day for seven days. And you can even test on day three and see how things are going, and then test again on the seventh day and see if you hit your target. And realize that 
even as you're dosing it, your tank is using it up, so it wouldn't be a pure added 70 milliliters. You've added that much, but the calcium might not jump to that because some of it got used up, so it's a little bit less. But if you were to, anything you're dosing to your tank, you don't want to overdose it. You don't want to put it all in at once. And so I oftentimes will either dilute something with a lot of tank water and have a trickle in out of a hole in the cup sitting on the edge of my tank, or I can use a doser and tell it to put in this much, but then I have to remember to update the doser with new programming for an additional amount or to calibrate it for the correct amount. I mean, there's so many things involved. But the bottom line is, if, for example, you had to fix something in your tank, one thing that we tend to fix rapidly is alkalinity. When it goes askew, we want to fix it as quickly as possible. And I will go to the reef chemistry calculator, just type that into Google, and then you will say my tank volume is this, you know, this many gallons. And then it'll say, what is your current uh, alkalinity and what do you want it to be? And then it'll say, what product are you using? And I always use baked baking soda, which is soda ash. And it will say, you need this much. And so, for example, I might need 11 teaspoons. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. So I would mix up six and gradually add that to the tank and then wait a couple of hours and kind of measure and see where things are. And, uh, you know, if everything's fine, add the other five. And then measure and say, huh, it was right. <laughs> the calculator was correct. But if you were to pour in all 11 and there was a mistake or you had a typo or you picked the wrong product, that could hurt your tank. So adding a little bit now and then a little bit in a little while later is definitely a good approach when it comes to dosing anything to your tank. So whatever recipe you're following, you like to break it up. And think about all the people that use dosing pumps. And instead of just dosing in the right amount for the day, they like to dose it every hour for 24 hours, like a drop, a drop, a drop, a drop, a drop throughout the day. And I'm thinking, man, I, I just want it in the tank. <laughs> I just turn it on, you know, get the alkalinity in there in the morning, you know, put the calcium in in the evening. I mean, that's it. But some people like to, you know, spread it out through eight or 10 or 12 doses or 24 doses. And so they are putting in small amounts at different times. They're not hitting the tank with it all at once. It's the same thing. So keep that in mind when you're manually dosing anything, you don't have to put it all in at once. Um, Jay says, I forget what lighting he uses for his refugium. It's an LED light. It's an XHO. I can kind of point this down. You can see it right there. And um, it's pretty close to the water. It's about four inches off the surface. And uh, I took out half the plants. I th one of the things that was pointed out to me was like, I'm not harvesting enough out to encourage more growth. And so the undergrowth is probably dying off. And as it's dying off, it's releasing the nitrate back into the system is the theory. So what I'm doing now is I, I cleaned out all that substrate down there. I took out a whole bunch of detritus, which was great. It needed to happen anyway. I'm just, I was more motivated. And then um, I pulled out about half the plant, I guess. I don't know. There's a lot of bristle worms down there. And I didn't get stung, so I'm very proud of that. But I think increasing, and if I pull out some each week, either I'll just run out of Calerpa, um, or I will maybe see a change, or maybe just everything I've been doing, reset in the reef, vacuum in the sand bed, clean out the detritus, cutting back on the plants, all these things combined will get my nitrate where it needs to be. Um, you know, and move forward, we'll just see improvement in the coming months and then hopefully lots of coral growth so that it starts to look a little more full because it does look a little bit empty to me. But compared to last time, I don't hate it. Last time I really hated the tank for a good three to six months. I just, every time I looked at it, I was disgusted. And uh, <laughs> that's a long time to not like your tank. But it took a while, things started growing in. I was like, all right, I like it better now. And this time, I'm not feeling that way. I'm feeling a lot more good about it. I know Dwayne was more freaked out about it than I was, which was kind of funny. He was like, man, what have I done? And I was like, it's okay. And he's just like, how are you handling this so well? <laughs> and he was really stunned at my reaction. And I was like, I don't know. This has been a hell of a year. Maybe it's fine. You know, I don't know. I've been doing some purging. Boogie says, how have you been? I'm doing all right. Um, I'm trying to get more rest. I am trying to work on orders for my customers. I am making progress. I'm getting things done. I'm getting slowly caught up on these orders that have been waiting for so long. Uh, those people were super patient with me and were willing to wait. And trust me, um, one of the things that I discuss in therapy, because I'm doing grief therapy, is uh, 
how can I get more work done? Because that has been a real hurdle. That's one of the re main reasons I went was I could not get any work done. I just could not be focused. I could not expend the mental energy to do things. I just couldn't do it. And it's one thing to say, I'll just make myself do it, but it wasn't happening. And so I've been working with this person and talking and discussing my feelings and all that kind of stuff. And I have gotten more done this week than previous weeks. So, I mean, it's baby steps and I'm working on me to uh, keep myself of sound mind and sound body. And we'll see where I am in a few more months. Thanks for asking. Aw. Jake says, your old video about Anemone Care is largely responsible for me getting into the hobby almost six years ago. Now I work at my local fish store and specialize in caring for the corals. Kudos on you. Well, hey, kudos on you too. I mean, you saw something that excited you. You jumped in, you got involved, and it turned into something. Now you're working in a fish store. Who knows where you'll be another five or ten years from now. It, it's kind of exciting to, to think where we start off and where we end up. I mean, when I started my tank back in 97... I just wanted to spend money on me. I was like, that's it. I'm buying myself an aquarium. And I bought myself a little 29 gallon aquarium and you know, set it up. And after it was cycled, I went and bought one piece of live rock because it was so darn expensive at $8 a pound. And uh, I put in two clownfish. <laughs> and that was my start. There was no corals back then. I mean, there were some, but I didn't understand them. I was thinking feather duster, uh, hermit crab, um... Maybe a three-spotted damselfish, you know, that kind of stuff. That was the things I knew as a kid. And so when I was coming back into the hobby, I decided to do that. Adam says, what are your thoughts on an NPS tank? I think they're really cool. And you can get some really nice pieces. They're actually a little bit easier to run because you can put so much food in them. Uh, you don't have to worry about special lighting. I think, I think you can run them a little cooler, too. They don't have to be as warm as our reef. Not 100% sure of that one. But you can get some really cool corals that we normally don't see. The non-photosynthetic corals, like the, I think the Rizzo's is one of them. Um, of course, Dendro's and Sun Corals are work fine in there, but you know the Dendro's like light. But there's, there's Gorgonians you can do, and there's all these cool corals. You can, you can make a really interesting biotope that I'd say, whew, five out of a hundred, or maybe it's less, maybe it's one out of a hundred reef keepers tries. The non-photosynthetic tanks, when you come across and you're like, oh my God, that tank is awesome. Where did you buy those corals? Because you can never find them anywhere. And usually it's someone that has a hookup at a fish store or this one guy, I think he's in the Vegas area, Vegas or Phoenix. And he literally works for a fish store and he was able to bring in some really cool stuff because he could add things onto the order. And he had a heck of a setup, and he was using white lights so we could all appreciate it. He kept posting pictures and videos on YouTube, I mean on uh, Facebook. Ah, love that tank, and I haven't seen it in a good six months. Um... <laughs> Luca said, I'm really stressed. In the past, only my mom would look after the reef once a month at, at the time. The fish were fat and healthy, as well as the corals that exploded with growth, because I trained her well. Yeah, it's nice when you have someone that's been doing it long term. I One of my things that's going to happen in the uh, coming months is I'm going to build a new building in the backyard. I've mentioned it before. It's going to be for work, so I don't have to work in the living room. Because it's nice to have the reef tank and have a television, but I always have what I'm working on in front of me. Whether it's an order I'm packing or something that's drying that I glued or whatever. It's just it's a constant reminder of work 24-7 and I can't not see it. And Dwayne said, Mark, you absolutely must build that building. And so I'm going to pour a slab of concrete out there. I'm going to do a building. I think it's going to be a metal building because the price of lumber is ridiculously high. I mean, let's just pretend that building's going to cost $15,000 to build. And all it is is four walls and a roof with a door with insulation and heat and air. That's all I want. I don't, and, and light, obviously. But I don't want anything else in there. I don't want plumbing. I don't want drains. I, don't, I just need some work tables to glue things on. And I'd like a, a room inside the building for all the things I sell that they'll be dust-free and I can get them out of the house because I have bedrooms that are filled with products I sell. <laughs> And this whole house feels like, I mean, 
I joked about this with my tax person. I was like, the whole house is a write-off. I'm like, no, you can't do that. I said, tell the IRS to come here and walk around. <laughs> and they're going to say, oh, yeah, it kind of is everywhere. I'm like, it totally is. This is everything. And if it's not the business of Milo's Reef, it's the business of YouTube. Because even YouTube is a paycheck I have to file taxes on, right? And this right here and the camera I use and all that stuff is all used for business. So putting that building out there to work out there and not do it in my living room would be fantastic. And I'm very excited to do that. And if the building, like I was saying, if the building costs 15000 to build normally, with the price of lumber, it could be 45000 right now. So I'm thinking maybe a metal building would be the better choice where I'm not using wood lumber since lumber is so crazy high. But I've heard metal is shooting up too. So whatever it is, I got to do it pretty darn quick so I can get that going. And the sooner that's built and the sooner I can take the things out of this house and put them out in the workshop, workshop number two, because <laughs> I'll have one workshop that where I cut everything out and edge it and all that. And then I'll have one workshop where I glue and then I get to walk past the tank a thousand times. By the way, you know, I work out of my home as you, so many of you know, some of you don't. Uh, some people think I have a store. I have an online business at milosreef.com and uh, I walk so much. I went through my phone I was just, I went to the, um, to my step stuff, you know, the, uh, what do they call this thing? Fitness. <laughs> Sorry. Couldn't think of the word. Uh, so up here I have all these little circles that I accomplish and this was yesterday and I had like 10,000 steps. I tend to walk four to five miles in my house a day and I very easily come up on 10,000 steps a day just doing what I do. That's what I'm saying. I'm never bored. I, I, If I actually take a day off and do nothing but just sit in front of the TV and just absorb friends for like 10 hours and I don't close the circle, I get mad <laughs> because I'm so used to seeing it closed because you get a badge. You get a badge every month if you do all your stuff. And I uh, didn't. Uh, one day last month, I apparently had a Sunday where I just relaxed and probably complained about my back or something and uh, didn't get my badge for last month. That was disappointing. Um, okay, Jay says, a lot have talked about LEDs, but haven't heard anything about how to, how to tell when it's time to replace them, other than they just burn out. How would you decide when it's time to, to junk and replace? Great question. So let's take Dwayne as an example. Dwayne made his own LED lights in the first place. And when he did that, he soldered in all these diodes with all the Meanwell drivers, and he hooked it all up, and he protected as best he could from salt damage and he ran everything at a hundred percent all day every single day hundred percent on every channel and every year he took the light down he unsoldered all the LEDs and put brand new ones in and put it up and he did the next one and the next one and the next one and I think he had like eight lights over his tank that he ran everything at a hundred percent and Dwayne has a beautiful SPS reef I just saw him post a picture on Facebook I'm gonna share it with you guys give me a second to find it his uh, reef is so pretty. I've done a video about his tank on this channel before. Let me just pull this up. So here is his tank as of right now. Let me do the share thing here so you can see it. Okay, so there it is. And he runs this, he, right now he's running the sky, which is the new light from Neptune Systems. And he runs it on all channels on 100% every single day. <laughs> That's his thing. He believes in 100% light. He is running everything at overdrive level. And he knew that his LEDs were getting cooked, being run nonstop like that. And that's why he was replacing them with uh, new LEDs. Then later on, he went ahead and he uh, upgraded through store credit to get some radions. And he was running them over his tank. And I think they were at 100%. He'd make sure to clean the fans on them and stuff like that. But he was happy. But you're saying, how do we know when they're no good anymore? One method would be to measure lighting intensity in your tank, just to kind of see. Another indicator might be how is the coral growth in your tank? Has it slowed down or is it the same? I know there's a huge debate about can you actually measure PAR from LEDs because that uh, measurement is designed to be photosynthetic uh, active radiation, I believe, which is normally measured from the sunlight rather than from artificial lighting or metal halides. So uh, in the past, manufacturers would say that these LEDs are good for five years. 
So that kind of gave you a baseline that your lights are only good for, good for five years, typically, maybe less. And But they kept saying, you don't have to buy any bulbs. You don't have to spend any more money. You literally just buy this once. You're good for five years, and it's using less power, so you're going to save all kinds of money during that time. And so everyone jumped on board and bought LED lights. Some people, like me, tend to use something until it's dead. <laughs> and then when it dies, we fix whatever's broken and keep using it some more. And I have one friend who had a bunch of radions over his tank, and he kept saying his tank didn't seem as bright, the corals weren't growing as well. And he says, you know what, I think I might need to get new lights. I don't know. I mean, they're still on. And I said, wait a minute, those are like Gen 3 radions. When did those things come out? You know, and I looked it up in like 2014. I said, dude, those things are six, seven years old. Have you got your money's worth out of them? And so he bought Gen 5 and he replaced it and his tank's brighter and his corals are growing. So that was just a, uh, what do you call that? A, uh, a casual observation of change, of switching. But physically knowing something's bad or needs to be replaced, I would say it's still a judgment call at this point. I can't really point to anyone and say, well, Sanjay says, and then you know, okay, I've got to do such and such. Where we knew with metal halides, they were good for about a year. We knew with T5s, they're good for about nine months. With LEDs, the whole idea was that they last 50,000 hours, and you just divide your schedule into that and kind of get an idea of how long that could potentially last you under ideal conditions. But then there's a lot of other factors that come into play, like is your tank covered with uh, acrylic or glass to the lightest to penetrate, penetrate through that? Is it screen? Is it nothing? Is it wide open? Is it close to the water and getting spattered? Is it dirty? Is that salt creep? You know, there's a lot of things that come into play. But uh, I would say, generally speaking, when you're having a light fixture that's LED, I would like to think it's going to be good for five years from the point of install. Uh, I've had mine installed, I don't know, two months so far, so I've got a while to go. <laughs> Hopefully they'll do really well for me because I do love the look of the tank. Um, we're heading kind of into, it, it looks perfect in my eyes, it looks terrible on this webcam. But um, the... Uh, the sky's spectrum, whatever I programmed in months ago, I'm just loving it. And it's going from dim in my morning, which is like 1130 in, in the daytime, which for anyone else is lunchtime. And then it, it comes up higher and higher to about 2 o'clock, dips down for about half an hour, and then it goes up high again for about 3 to 4, 5-ish. And then it, it tapers down all the way till 1030 at night. And I'm loving looking at my tank any time of day. It's just so pretty. I, I do like what I'm seeing. I actually can see shimmer on the sand bed down here in the bottom, which you can't see with the webcam. I see shimmer on that wall over there. A lot of people said you're not getting any shimmer. I do get shimmer. It's just not blatant shimmer like you do from a, like the ripples you see in a swimming pool or across the sand in very shallow water at a beach. But I'm very happy with uh, these lights, and I have no regrets. I mean, matter of fact, I'm, it's one of those things where like, I kind of do wish I'd done it sooner because I'm using a lot less power now. But... Um, you know, they're quiet, they do their job, and they I programmed them once, and that's it. It's really nice. Uh, Lincoln says, do you know what makes a red bubble tip anemone bubble? Mine used to bubble in my old tank, but once I upgraded from my 29-gallon to a 70-gallon, they stopped. No, that's been an ongoing debate for a super long time, and people say more flow, less flow, more light, less light, more food, less food. And no one, not one person, I have actually done a deep dive into Google to see if there was anything out there, anybody. And there's just nothing that you can literally do like Bob said and make it happen. I've seen it in tanks where they used wave mode and the water did this back and forth all the time and they bubbled. But I've seen tanks with wave mode where the tentacles did this. Uh, it's just, it's kind of a mystery. And no one has a solid answer. There's a lot of guesses. If you go to my bubble tip video and just read the comments, you'll see 50 different ways of making them bubble. <laughs> and, you know, the funny thing is I've got some anemones in my anemone cube, the little nano nems near the top. Some of them have bubbles. And I have some, well, I had some. <laughs> They're gone now. I had some way down here near the sea bay. They had bubbles. And the sea bay is right behind it. And yet there was other ones next to it with long tentacles, you know, side by side. This one had bubbles and this one had long tentacles. There's no real reason uh, or rhyme or reason why they don't have the bubbles. No one's really able to figure it out. I'd love to figure it out. But uh, to this point, we still don't know. Uh, Jay says, that's crazy. I wouldn't have the guts to run my lights at 100%. I'd cook my corals. 
Uh, my tank is running at a maximum of you know, the peak of the day at 60%. So I literally have the ability to push more light into my tank if I want at this point. But Dwayne has been an SPS keeper for a very long time, and he grows these beautiful colonies, and he grows a ton of more corals to sell to fish stores that the stores can sell to consumers like you. And uh, he, so he's a machine, and he grows coral. <laughs> and you saw his tank a little while ago. It, it's beautiful, and he shares all the time. It's um, He's been a good friend of mine for probably coming up on 20 years. Uh, Butts says... I would love a huge tank like yours one day. How do you keep up with that big of a water change? Well, I don't like doing water changes. That's the thing. But I have made some of it easier with the way I, I plumbed it all in. But there's still some effort involved, and I don't enjoy it. And I prefer not to do it at all. <laughs> but if I need to do it, especially now, at this point, I could change 200 gallons of water and, and come down to about here. And the corals would be exposed for maybe 10 minutes, and I could refill it. And I could, it, the question is, how quick can I make water? And, you know, how much salt can I afford to, to buy? Because salt actually turns out it's not as cheap as I imagined it was. You know, there's been this saying forever, the cheapest solution you could do with your tank is to change water. And uh, I just believed that statement. It must be true. You know, I mean, why would I argue with that? That makes sense. You mix salt water and you change water. It's a lot cheaper than buying a reactor and buying, I don't know, like a jar of GFO that's 80 bucks. Or, you know, I'm talking, uh, Roafoss was expensive. There's other brands that are cheaper. But the point is, I bought a bunch of Nopox. I think those were $35, $40 a bottle. And I bought like five bottles, and it didn't change my nitrate at all, but it crashed my phosphates, and I had pink slime everywhere. It was really awful. And because everyone was like, well, you overdosed it. I'm like, no, I didn't. I literally dosed less than what it said to use on the bottle, and I still had that slime everywhere, and it completely ignored my nitrate and completely crashed my phosphate. It was insane, and I had to stop. So <laughs> the... Uh, the, the thing is, is that when it comes to doing water changes, I don't like doing them, but I have been doing some. And I wanted to know what does it cost for a water change? And I took the price of my barrel. I buy a barrel of salt that's uh, 1,026 gallons of salt water. It's like 500 pounds. And I think, I, if I remember correctly, it was like 40 cents or 45 cents per gallon of salt plus the water I make. Which, to me, water's free. I mean, I pay the water bill every month. I don't care what it is. But the salt adds up. So if you do a 100-gallon water change, that's 40 bucks. Do 200 gallons, that's $80 in water change. $80! <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> so. um, Ron says, if I wanted Fiji Rock, no matter what the cost, can it still be had? I don't believe Fiji Rock is being exported at this time. I'm not 100% sure. I'll try to find out for you because I liked it too. We used it for a long time. Walt Smith International was selling it. Um, I'm trying to even think where they are in their lives. I think I have this weird feeling they sold off the business or closed the business or the business had to close because of COVID or something like that or had to close because of the laws of exportation had changed. I, I seem to remember there was a lot of layoffs, and then they were kind of reopening, and they kind of had permission from the Tongan government to do Tonga Branch, and then that turned out to maybe not work out. I mean, there's there's been a lot of change. So um, getting rock from Fiji, I'm not sure that is possible, but I'll reach out to Walt and see if I can get an answer. Or, you know, defend, he should know the answer to that, and then I can let you know. Hey, Jay, I would recommend you try, you're saying you're running your radions at 45 to 55% max for about five years. So first of all, they're five years old. <clears throat> so if they were 55% five years ago and they're five years old now, they're probably not 55% equal intensity, you know? They're probably less. You could probably come up higher. When I was running my radion over the Anemone Cube, um, I ran it at 75% and the cube was okay. Everything was alive. It was fine. And then one day I thought, eh, why don't I change it to 80%? And all of a sudden the tank looked so much better. So I would suggest you play around with your, your programming a little bit. Maybe bring it up to 75 or 80%, even if it's just for like a couple hours a day, you know, just a little window, or a couple hours in the evening, for example, if you want to ramp up to this thing and then drop it down. And see how you like your tank, because you might see some really nice stuff with the intensity ramped up. And just give it a shot.
Uh, Jay says, do you still do the sunrise effect from left to right like you did with the halides? That was a really cool effect. Yeah, I have. I didn't do that. I was talking when Terrence was here and we were programming. I said, well, I usually do this light and then this light and then this light. And he kind of looked at me like, we can do that if you want to. And I was like, eh, I'm changing lights. Let's just change everything. <laughs> just like when Dwayne showed up, eh, just change everything. Just do it all. So I'm not running that staggered schedule that I ran for more than a decade. And, you know, there's times where I kind of miss it, but I'm enjoying looking at the whole tank lit up at the same time and watching the whole tank dim down at the same time. It's been nice, and uh, so I'm kind of adapting. But it, it was a really neat feature. I'm sure it confused people when they visited. They thought one light was out. Like, yeah, it's out, but it wasn't out. <laughs> it's intentionally turned off at this point when they showed up. So I only got to see part of the tank lit up, and part of it was dim. It was kind of this cool effect. Well, um, Jay's continuing about LEDs. The uh, thing is that if you run them at 100%, you're absolutely going to burn them out sooner. I mean, you're just going to wear them out versus running them at a lesser intensity. They're not running as hot for as long per day. So there is some physics going on there that would actually affect their lifespan. But um, I don't know that running a LED... I mean, I just don't know. Tulio might know. But I don't know that running an LED chip at 100% for 50,000 hours is guaranteed. It might still be on, but it may not be what it was when you first turn off the first time. <laughs> uh, Adam says, how do you stop soft corals from growing so much? I have a 125 gallon soft tank and I have to frag most of my corals every six months. That is why most people that have been in this hobby a while never put soft corals in their tank again. They, they did it in the beginning, it was cool. They got to watch their tank fill in rapidly and they felt like they'd accomplished something, and it was neat. But then those same people say, I will never put that in my next tank. I mean, you just, there's this rule of things. I'll never put zinnia, I'll never put mushrooms, I'll never put leathers. Uh, you know, there's these are the things, uh, green star polyps <laughs> and cilia. Uh, these are all corals that beginners tend to get, and they're like, oh my god, this is so cute. And look, now I got 10. Oh, now I got 90. Oh, it's so neat. That whole rock is covered. I love it. But then they're like, oh, that rock is covered. I can't put anything else on there. And when they break down, they're scraping it all off to get rid of it. That is literally what happens when it comes to uh, soft corals. We don't recommend it in a reef tank because we're trying to grow different corals. Um, and a lot of us like LPS corals. And we like SPS corals. And the softies just don't work well with them. Uh, Bot says, what hours of the day are your lights running? I have mine running from 10 to 10. Mine run from 11.30 a.m. starting off to 11.30 at night turning off completely, but they're so dim for several hours in the morning and several hours in the evening that really my peak of the day is probably 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. That's where they're getting the bulk of it. Yeah. I cannot believe I still can't think of the other topic I wanted to talk about. That's going to irritate me. And then later on, I'll think of it. And it'll be too late. Uh, bots, I don't actually have a schedule for water changes. I do them sporadically. That is my definition of a schedule. I don't want them in the mood. Uh, Jake says, I'm, if I'm interested in buying a yellow tang, should I wait for the aquaculture production to start, or should I try and buy one of the limited wild-caught specimens at the ridiculous price tag? <laughs> ah, you know, I would just kind of keep your eyes open. If you see something you can afford, go for it. Uh, you may come across somebody selling their tank that they're breaking down that has a yellow tang in it, and maybe the whole setup is the price of one yellow tang in a store. I don't know, but I wouldn't rush it. Just like me, I want to build a building, but I want to pay lumber prices, so... You have to just kind of figure out what works best for you. You may come across something. You might come across a good deal. You might walk into a Petco and there's a yellow tang right there. And you're like, oh, it's only 50 bucks. Done. And you have one. You know, that'd be nice. I've, I've had this one for, oh, five, six years. Uh, 
Uh, Nicholas says, has your phosphate issue been resolved with all the work you've done? I, I, I recall you were dosing phosphate RX for it. I've been dosing phosphate RX for a decade, uh, longer, almost probably 11 years now. I love that product and I use it as needed when the tank numbers go too high. But I know also with my nitrates being high, I don't want the phosphates to be too low. So I'm just kind of like hit or miss. It's sort of like, mm, I'm gonna use it this week or I haven't used it in eight weeks. Let me use it today kind of a thing. That's usually how it goes. Uh, I will be going through and testing both tanks because I, I really don't want those corals to die in there. Um, that was one of Dwayne's concerns. He said, you're gonna put things out there you're gonna put things in that tank to die and you might as well not even put them in there then. You shouldn't even do it. He's like, if you're gonna do this, you gotta do it. And his frag tank is part of his reef. The reason mine is not is I would have to step over plumbing every single time for the rest of my life. And I don't wanna run plumbing across the floor and have something to trip over or step over forever. I just don't wanna do that. So since I can't do that, it is a standalone system. It makes it harder for me as a hobbyist, because now I have to do it. And uh, there's people out there that have multiple tanks, all separate, standalones, and they're testing them all and they're taking care of them all. It's not fun to do that. To me, as a hobbyist, I don't want, I want one. And I like making satellite tanks all off the main one. That's my preference. But I couldn't in that situation. If I had thought it well ahead when I was pouring the concrete, I could have put a channel across the floor that would be, you know, even with the floor and put pipe through that area, but I didn't think of it, and I'm not about to get a jackhammer now to break it open. Um, Anid, Anid Rude, I think that's right, said, how do you keep your sand so white and clean? Um, it just is. It typically is. The tank's been around for a very long time. It's coming up on eight years old, and good flow is important. I have a lot of flow coming off the vortex, and there's another one back there, and then the uh, random flow generators at the top, those, those uh, penductor things, they push a ton of water around, and all that movement keeps the sand clean. All right, guys. Well, we've been talking for two hours. I think that's enough for this week. I, um, I appreciate you tuning in. We uh, had 180 people on here right now, so everyone's about to hang up. I just want to say it is water test Saturday. Please do test your tank. Clean your protein skimmer. Check your top-off container. Make sure your dosing containers have enough fluid in them. Water tests, as Caitlin said, save lives. And if you don't test your waters and things go wrong, and things start dying, and then you start testing your water, you're kind of going backwards. You want to steer the ship before the Titanic hits the iceberg, right? So we want to see where our numbers are and make little tiny adjustments now instead of big adjustments later. I hope that you guys have a great 4th of July if you're in America, and if you're not and you're somewhere else, I hope you have a good 4th of July. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for tuning in this week, and I will be releasing a video later this week of the big reset of the tank that you guys can look forward to. Bye!